number of strides from canter to trot, canter to walk, canter to halt? Uh, that's a good question. Did you all hear that, the number of strides? If you just, the easy thing to understand is just down two. Now, I didn't invent it. I actually just learned it by watching videos of all the top people in dressage when it's really at its best and smoothest. And it's always in two beats. It's pretty interesting. If you have a look at Charlotte Dujardin or someone like that and just measure it and you slow it, there's a really good program. That you, well, you don't have to buy the program, but there's a simple version of this program called Dartfish where you can analyse strides in slow motion. You can see that everything's going up and down in two beats because in dressage, that's what makes it really beautiful because it's so smooth going up and down like music, not, not abrupt. But of course, I'm talking dressage um, and the European sports and we all get stuck in that and probably 90% of you are in my, in my camp there with that. But of course, if you're doing other sports um, like uh, raining, sometimes things are in one beat or camp drafting and that's okay. But see, I didn't mention it, but part of the point is that if things take too long, you ask with the aid and the answer takes too long, he's not going to do it and he gets more and more foggy. And so my point is if we look at... See, they're not going to necessarily tell us that's the unconscious competence that they're doing two beats. That's, they, they just say, this is how you do it, you know, close your fingers or whatever, sit like this. But the fact is that's the time frame and the horse works like that because, you know, we always are, we're always forming habits in the horse. So um, it's worth thinking about that because the horse stays safe if we make really good habits. But if everything's a little bit hit and miss and guesswork, then it makes him less safe and it makes our performance poorer too. So for me, this is very much about not only, you know, good welfare, but it's also helps your performance, improves what you do. Yeah, good question. Oh, so, yeah, two beats for everything. If you go down, it's, uh, so if you go down two gates, I, I probably should just explain that a bit more too. See, when you go up, even if you go in the start box into gallop from halt, like you do in cross country, the horse can actually still be at least cantering by the second beat. So he's really powerful in the hind end to do all the upward transitions very fast and very strong. But the downward transitions are poor in the horse naturally because what he has to do when he puts the brakes on, the pectoral muscles that he uses for slowing are so small, like if you isolate them all, you could fit them in a bucket and they would be about half a bucket full. They're very small. And that's why at any gate above walk, he has to use his back end and sit. And that's why dressage trainers focus on sitting because he has to dig his hind legs into the soil basically like dropping a plough with a tractor, to slow down. So he has to sit and really use his back, and you see it extremely in raining. Um, and so when you do downward transitions, he has to learn that. Um, it doesn't come naturally to him when you pull on the reins to use his hindquarters. But if you start by saying, OK, when you do trot halts, for example, Isabel Worth was the one who taught me the value of these transitions from trot to halt, that if you go from trot to halt um, in a young horse, you want it in four beats, and that's why I'm focusing on, on that. But then as the horse moves up through the ranks in dressage and show jumping and eventing, you then want it in three beats. That means you'll not only be smooth, but probably square in the halt. And if you do it in two beats like a Grand Prix horse, it would be smooth, square, and through. In other words, he'd be sitting, lowering, and able to do a transition from trot to halt in two beats. But for the Younger horses, we, do, we expect it, you know, two beats per gate, so trot to halt, you're going down two gates, so therefore two beats per gate. Is that clear? Okay. Good question. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I had a little note to yourself out there thinking, oh, I better explain that, but it wasn't quite the right time. There's too many horses moving around. So I'd just like to know, with the running leading the leg, the running forward leg you're talking about, yep. is that more or less the horse is left or right-handed balanced differently? Um, if they were more balanced, would it be less obvious the leading running leg? Yeah. Did you all hear that? The, the running leg, um, if the horse was more balanced, would he be more even um, in his downward transitions because when he's got a running leg, he tends to be uneven. He puts more pressure. 
if he's a right front leg runner, you know, you just see if you get people to halt a horse 10 times without knowing what your intention is, just say, halt 10 times. Most horses will halt with the right front leg going and boom. I like to be in the start blocks basically because it's ready to go. Um, but the left front, if he halts on left last, it's usually going to be more square with the right front leg runner. Um, and so you're right, if he's actually more even, he, you won't see the difference. And like us, some of us are ambidextrous, so we're not so very right-handed. And others of us are very left-handed. So he might be born a bit even, and I've seen quite a few horses like that. That, that makes it easier for you to train. But some horses are ridiculously one-sided, and they really lean on the right rein. They're really stiff on the right side. See, they're not really born that stiff one side to the other. It is a myth to say they're in the utero bent one way more than the other because actually they move around a lot. Um, uh, I know that from uh, reproductive physiology that they do change. So it's not because they're only spending all this time one way, but um, they are handed and there is always that uh, potential for one pair to do more and that makes them uneven. And the purpose of it in nature for quadrupeds is so that when he's galloping, he doesn't run on his own, fr hit his front feet. See, when a horse is crooked, they all, all, I have a video of it for, with my dog galloping beside the quad bike, that you see that if he's r on the right leg leading, his right hind is to the outside and his left hind is in the middle. And how often do we see that in the dressage ring? Like how many horses, when you first canter them, are dead straight down the side? It's nearly always hind quarters in if they're leading on the right or leading the left hind quarters in that way. And it's nature because, you know, he, you don't want him running over his front leg. So in a gallop, he cannot be actually perfectly straight because, he, you know, he'll run over himself. So he's a little bit crooked. But, yeah, the, the evening up the right side. So just the simple way is just to think if he's very heavy on the right, do a few – you'd only need to do five or six transitions – from trot to halt, for example, because that's the most glaring one to do, where you go a bit more woo-woo with the right rein and you will definitely see a difference. And it also means that um, even in sort of subtle high-level movements, like um, some horses that I've worked with where they, they struggled going from, say, um, piaf to passage. Now, what they do is they often go straight away too big and they don't... They miss the shorter step and that's simply because, in my experience, this is how I deal with it, they just run through your right hand and instead of the right hand having a limiting effect on the right front leg, they actually, and, and shortening it, they run straight through it, lean on it and, and they're already going too big. So getting them even makes a huge difference to getting them uh, square. And I only learned that from, you know, from lessons and then also from studying biomechanics of the differences between the two diagonal pairs and they're all like that. You know, like we are more or less crooked. Well, in biomechanics. <laughs> like I think this is a great move by Pony Club to talk about biomechanics because we can lead um, the foreground here. And secondly, often we see horses later when we're watching dressage, we don't see good symmetry lines, nor we see a lot of compensation going on and you'll see horses going wide behind. And that's all addresses, that goes back to the biomechanics, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, absolutely. And thank you for that. And yet it is really the new area, it's not even well understood. It's not taught very often. Um, I first, as I said, I first, there's a paper in 2014 that started to um, suggest these differences and then a guy called Lars Ropstoff in Sweden who works at the vet school there, they've got a lot of money for the vet school because it's publicly funded and um, started to do, uh, and, and Hilary Clayton in America did the same sorts of experiments on a uh, straight line with, you know, um, looking at with uh, stickers on the horse's legs so that you could see the differences in the diagonal pairs and she is one of the first vets to say to people be very careful to say a horse is lame because it's different to being uneven. They're all naturally a little bit uneven, and we are too. You know, if you look at us absolutely perfectly, you'll see us. Um, and what was the second thing you said? The yeah, absolutely. And 
it makes such a difference to getting them, uh, getting them just even on those reins. And that also affects your turns. You know, you notice that horses, if you, if you keep looking for the patterns, and that's what I started to do, and the patterns of the right front leg runner are that they want to fall out right more than left. They um, they tend, if they shy or rear, they tend to do it left because that right front leg's out like a prop, um, pushing them suddenly left. Um, if they, when you do short steps, and this goes back to the, what you were saying about the dressage, when you watch, you watch horses, even at the Olympic level, just get your uh, YouTube out and you watch. How many horses at Olympic level, when they do Piaf, go up and... So remember the right front leg's the running leg, so therefore so is the left hind. So you watch how many horses go up and down perfectly with the right hind, but the left hind does a step. And they keep gaining ground. And if you just say to the riders, first of all, do some trot halts and get your horse really even on the right rein and left. This is the work I, my, work I do in my life in teaching is just with problems like that. And they're mostly nowadays about lateral, lateralization. And then when they are doing PF, is just when the left hind's coming up and the edge you go a little bit, whoa, just a little bit, and you, now he learns to do it on the spot. There's so much you can do. And then the other thing is the... And this is why I do a lot of work in the walk. It's going back to old school, but the reason for it is that everything's in slow motion, everything's separated by one beat, and because you can only really talk to the horse in the swing phase, you can catch a swing when you want to. So you can go turn when the right front leg or left front leg's about to leave the ground, and just as it's mid-swing, you can't talk to it anymore, but here comes the right hind, so you can go and kick. So that's the separation, and... You know, I've been talking about this for a while, but not to use your reins and legs at the same time because whenever you do, there won't be the, the correct, won't be the correct timing for the legs. And if you get it all right at the walk, you can make mistakes in the trot because he's already got the habits. Like he knows the aid. He doesn't, you don't have to talk to the biomechanics so much because it's like a habit from that aid to just slow or just shorten. So it makes a difference to, to do that. And that's... That swing phase material came out in 2014, and so it's fairly, it's fairly recent. But I think it's so relevant for uh, anything you do in horse training is evening up that laterality. No, no, this will work. I I was at a judges clinic and they were talking about horses being tight left or crooked left, like you've been saying, meaning they take a bigger step with the right. And one of the judges was a Werribee vet, and they said when they look at the cadavers, the whole vertebrae on the left side are shorter than the right. So if a horse is tight left, 90% of them are, should we be doing more bending work on the right to supple them, or isn't that a good way to fix it? Yeah, that is, like if the horse is tight... Uh, yeah, the, if the horse is... Basically, if the horse is more tight one side, should we do more work to supple them on that side? And yeah, we do. But see, I guess what, I, what I'm saying, and I might not have made it very clear, is that in the horse's life, if he's very right-handed, just like you and I, he develops the physiology of right and left-handedness more. Like, I use my right hand more. I pick things up with my right hand. If I've got to carry a heavy load, I do it with my right ever since I was a little boy. So you end up being stronger on that one side to the extent of the other, diminishing, and you probably adopt the posture of being one shoulder higher or lower and one side. So the horse is the same you know, if he tends to be more right-handed, like as a foal, he might even stretch one leg out further than, like typically his right leg when he grazes, he's already developing that physiology and so he gets more. So what we end up with, with a horse that by the time we can break it in and ride it as a three-year-old or so, is now we've already got a horse that's practised a fair bit of, you know, lateral work in his normal life. So yeah, we do need to do that work and First of all, making sure we can even up the biomechanics through stop and go um, helps a lot. So if he's, if he's heavy on the right rein, so the right front and left hind are runners, he's probably going to be lazy on the left front and right hind. So you, you've got to do more go work from your right leg. And we see that um, a lot. So evening them up and then doing your normal lateral work, you know, you would do where maybe a shoulder four, all those things that the old masters and good trainers continue to do are really good for the horse because they, they even him up 
uh, laterally as well as just you've got to get the diagonal pairs even and I think and then then soften the horse and teach him and you can actually change his physiology over the years you know where the more lateral w- suppling work you do either side he changes his his body he gets softer to one side than he was thank you that's perfect segue to my question which is um, they're handed in the same way we are and this is um, do, I'm sorry if I'm preempting anything that I haven't had a chance to read yet but will we be looking at the biomechanics of the young rider because it would be a good time in their riding lives to address their straightness and evenness too yeah it is there's a lot more work done on the rider than the horse only humans it's really you know when there's a lot of work showing that you know we tend to um, be stronger in one arm than the other one hand and grab things more with one and be shorter on one side one leg shorter and all of those things so those things we we do need to work on but they're they're a little bit easier because the the child is conscious and you can you can see it and you can get them to do things off the horse to be more even but it's just that recognising it in the horse is something that we haven't looked at in the past and that's really why I stress it. But, yeah, definitely we've got to do both. Because the, wor- the hardest thing is, see, it's such a difficult game because here is a horse, the standard, like, team model forward of horse is, you know, right front leg heavy and running through your right hand and stiff to the right and all those things. And there's your standard person as well, right-handed and... And um, I think often we have, if you test that with the way, the feeling people have in their hands, often they're less sensitive in one hand than the other. Like if they, two kilograms in one hand might feel like one kilogram in the other. And that's really the art of teaching, isn't it? But I think many coaches are very good at the rider. I reckon that's where we are. I don't know that we can do much better. We probably can, but I don't think we can do a whole lot better because I think the art of riding's been very good. My query and my point has always been the art of training, of teaching the horse. That's that's where we lag behind, and that's where we can make big strides. and And I'm really pleased to do it in Australia because um, it's taking shape in other countries, but it's, it should start here. Also, we're the biggest, second biggest pony club in the world, I think, aren't we? Is that right? I think we're way bigger than Canada. Canada's got about 3,000 pony club kids. Um, England's got more, but America hasn't got much either. You know, so we're a, we're a very big organisation here. Okay. So I think we're done. Everybody looks sort of weary. Mm. Oh, one question. I hope I've got you something else because this sounds like a biomechanics uh, talk. And... Uh, um, I just, I just need to ask about the syllabus we're going to introduce. The transition period between now and when? Next year, when? October. October. Okay. So, if the riders are doing certificates now and are stalling, say, at that K level, they're just not wanting... Well, when I say wanting, they want to do the K, but they are finding it difficult. Can we just transition them straight into the new syllabus? Yeah, we can. The beauty of the K2, I don't know if you're aware of it, we wanted to... You know what the K used to be? I did my K test and, you know, we rode bareback with a... just of the halter, uh, probably not ideal these days, jumping. Um, And um, it was all about just, you know, if you did stuff like that, you could sort of get another certificate. But nowadays, what, how we should see it, I think, is a really good way for, for kids to do a certificate and get the knowledge without necessarily having to do the riding part at the same level as, the, as like, the B test. And that's a good thing because, it, you know, there's, we, need new, we need alternative pathways for kids to continue with their education without necessarily going, well, I was only ever a C-level rider and that's where I finished and that's not what we want Pony Club to be. So, yeah, that's very possible. If I can chip in on that just from an uh, examining point of view in Victoria. So, if you've got riders that want to transition straight across onto the new syllabus, 
that's absolutely fine. The transition period for people that want to stick with what they've got, um, they want to see out the books that they've already bought and paid for. So those um, people who've got books in the field and want to do that or clubs that have got books in the cupboard and they want to use them, you have until about October 2020 to get them through. So if you've got EDD star C certificate, that should be a walk in the park. That Those certificates are a 12-month or less proposition. Even if you're just starting out, you should be able to get through those certificates in 12 months. C star, possibly, it will depend on the horse you've got going and the level that you're riding at because the C star does require a slightly higher level of riding. And the K certificate, it will depend on how far through the riders are with it. It has seven... The, the old syllabus, the K has seven options in it. So if they've already done four or five, I would be finishing out the seven and finishing on that because they've already done the work. If they're at the start of the process, you might want them to have a look at the new syllabus and get them to choose which way they want to do it. Could I just also say that one thing that um, we aim to do with the A test, um, and it's in the pipeline now, is to make the A test uh, give kids some recognised prior learning have done the A that gives them an automatic entry where they've only got to do a few more units to get some kind of diploma, um, government accredited diploma, which I think would really make Pony Club strong. Um, and that's 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 certainly my aim for for this, so that it's not just something kids did in Pony Club and then it's the end of their life. They could because many of them become horse, leaders in the horse industry. I mean our patron Heath Ryan was a pony clubber. There's many people, there's plenty of the people in this room who went through Pony Club as well and benefited from that and now teaching. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, in talking about biomechanics, the, um, the biomechanics really isn't relevant until you, at about B test level, I started to explore that more and certainly in A test, that's very much a big part of it. And what I've told you is pretty much all there is but it's just really knowing it thoroughly. But as coaches, even if you're not, you don't have to teach it to the C-level kid, if you've got a child at C-test C level, but you know it's just leaning on the right rein more than the left, do a few more half holds for the right rein to get it more even, and you'll certainly do well, but it's not something that the child needs to know. It just can help us as coaches. And that's why today I thought, how am I going to frame this in two lessons? I've got a lesson from E to D, so make it really simple about the most important things and then go through the, the, the rest of it with the, at the second lesson, the higher level. And I didn't get through... Uh, it looks like that's all I ever do is just walk, but um, it would take too long if we start trotting and doing... So you can just imagine you would do the same things in the higher gates and you know what you're doing there, so it's not a, something I need to teach coaches. It's really just the technique within the gates. Well, it, it's, we've sort of ebbed and flowed on this. Originally, we wanted to make it really very much online, um, but there are some arguments for having hard copy as well. But ultimately, I think it'll be both. I think it, it makes sense these days to have an online, an online version, doesn't it? Um, very much. And so I can, that's where we'd like to go. I'll for just sure. add a little into that. So Pony Club Australia are working with Sport Australia, who is the um, formerly known as the Australian Sports Commission, and um, the Sport Australia are the ones that are having a look at um, an online platform. It's not just as simple as sticking it up on the website, um, particularly if you want it to be an interactive model. So. There's an awful lot of work that goes into that. It's clearly not something that Pony Club Australia or Pony Club Victoria or any of the other states would be capable of constructing themselves. It's going to require specialist IT people to make that happen. So it's um, – I know Pony Club Australia are talking with Sport Australia about it. There's been some workshops on it and I know there's some tendering process happening. So it, it'll be a little while. Yeah. And in saying that too, I, I'm – I run an online diploma course for which you can get um, government uh, sponsorship. So, what do you call it? HEX. Um, and it's a government accredited course. And that's the course I'm hoping that kids with the A can slot into uh, for a, a final approval. But it's that, that's 
It is a long way off yet and it's only just a hope and a suggestion but it's certainly something that I'm keen to do um, so that it makes it very relevant. Given that there's so many challenges in getting, keeping coaches and getting coaches, particularly for the very small clubs and some of the more remote clubs, I was wondering if when you're rewriting the B and A curriculums, um, it might be a little bit more emphasis on um, those candidates providing some level of um, coaching and supervision to more junior riders as part of the developing the pipeline of coaches for Pony Club. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's very much a coaching council type of question too, isn't it? Um, that's how we want so to see the, the coaching council. The A goes. certificate has always had a component in it for um, coaching. It's been in there for decades, hasn't it, Sally? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, with the NCAS program that we run, Coaches or senior riders or associate riders can commence their NCAS preliminary from the age of 16. They can't be signed off and accredited until they're 18, um, but they can be coaching. And I encourage clubs far and wide to engage some of those older riders into those processes so that we can start producing the coaches of the future. Um, there's a lot of riders in Pony Club that when they get to that um, older level, they just want to be discipline specific. They just want to come to rally and do a flat lesson. They don't want to jump. They just want to come and do some jumping. They don't want to go and do cross country, whatever it might be. Rather than them coming for one hour and then going home, I would love you to encourage them to stay and do some work with the junior members and mentor them. And that way you build stronger clubs because you build stronger connections. The little kids look up to the big kids. The big kids engage with the little kids because they're invested in them. Oh, look, there's that little Sally over there. Sorry. There's that little Sally over there. She's so popular. Um, who was on the lead with me three months ago. Look at her go now. She's riding all by herself. And you foster those club spirits that, um, that you need to keep strong clubs. Um, Buddy up your senior riders with your experienced coaches for the mentoring. The NCAS coaching program is mentor-based. They're not supposed to just sit there with a book on their own and be left to their own devices. They're supposed to work with your experienced coaches, with your NCAS coaches, get a bit of sign-off along the way. So by the time they come through for assessment, they're already great. We're just going to dot the I's and cross the T's. So please, I encourage you, do it. Fund them. Buy the books for them, offer to pay for it. It's not very expensive. If your clubs are getting grants for training, use that to train your coaches. There's plenty of clubs across Victoria that have already done it and they've had ripping successes and they've kept their coaches and they've kept their senior riders engaged and they're growing stronger clubs. So please do it. If you need help doing it, drop me an email.